Okay, we're going to get started. I appreciate your patience. Welcome. Uh, we are very happy to have you here. My name is Tom Wolf. I'm a member of the Science, Medicine, and Technology Curriculum Committee, and our committee is very happy to bring you today's session. Uh, at this time, please take out your cell phones and uh, ensure they are silenced so uh, as not to distract from today's presentation. Thank you. Also, welcome to the crowd joining via Zoom in the Hess Virtual Classroom. Special thanks to our course uh, technician, Gloria Goodwin, for supporting our hybrid modality. If you have questions or comments to pose, please wait till after both of our presenters have uh, spoken. Uh, and uh, we kindly ask you to wait for the microphone so all participants can hear you. I will be bringing the mic uh, around. We look forward to welcoming you to our monthly program titled Music Unites Us, hosted next Tuesday, December 5th at 9.30 a.m. in the Jack H. Miller Center for the Arts. This program is a collaboration with the Holland Symph Symphony Orchestra and will feature a live performance of traditional African music. Coffee, cookies, and conversation begin at 9 a.m. Now I'm gonna introduce our two uh, speakers today. After receiving an MD from Creighton University School of Medicine, Hass member, Dr. Swanson, uh, practiced rheumatology for many years. Also, Dr. Swanson taught at Indiana University for 15 years and at several other schools. Before going to college, Hass member, Russell Dykstra served for six years in the US Navy where he worked as a nuclear propulsion engineer. He has a bachelor's degree from Hope College and a medical degree from the MSU College of Human Medicine. Dr. Dykstra practiced family medicine for many years. This class will explore effective time use for doctor's office visits, both for the patient and for the physician. Doctors Dykstra and Swanson will share wisdom from their many years of experience as physicians and from other contexts, including as patients themselves. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Swanson to kick it off. Thank you very much, Tom. It's my pleasure to be here again. Uh, Dr. Dykstra and I have shared a lot of exp a lot of uh, anecdotes as we went along here. And uh, so what we're gonna do today is, uh, this is an outline, we're gonna talk about the speakers You've heard about Dr. Dykstra and myself. I'm a subspecialist, I'm a rheumatologist. Dr. Dykstra is a family physician. He's uh, practiced in, in, uh, in the Holland area and he may know many of you. I uh, didn't practice in Holland. I practiced uh, uh, in Indiana for a good number of years, as I said, with also teaching at the University of, of Indiana. And then I taught uh, at the University of Illinois for a couple of years. And then we came here and I practiced in South Haven. So I've been around. But we're gonna we're gonna talk about today is how to make your visit with your doctor most effective. How many of you consider if you have an appointment at 1115, arriving at 1115 as being on time? No. Remember, you have to check in. The nurse has to get your vitals, do all that. So please think about coming a bit earlier. And so I always ask people what they consider being on time. And if your appointment's at 1115, please come in about 11. That way, I'm sitting there at 1115 waiting for you, and you can have all of my time. Determine the doctor's time budget. You can ask the nurse. How long is this appointment scheduled for? You know, you come in there and you've got a list of questions that are 20 pages long. You're not going to get through them and you're not going to have time for the doctor to even do anything or talk to you or even examine you. So if they say you have 15 minutes, which Russ and I both know when you're practicing medicine today, people who are not physicians try to tell you how to run your life. They, they, uh, uh, I, when I went into practice in South Haven, they said, well, how much time do you want 
for your follow-up of visits, how much for your, your initial visits. So I was able to set my own schedule. Many times, though, there was I ended up going over and people had to wait, I'm sorry, because people earlier took more time. And that's important. I got to take care of that man or that woman. And so if it takes 20 minutes or 25 minutes, so be it. But you need to know. So if you walk in there and know that you're a follow-up visit for 15 or 20 minutes, don't expect to be there for 45, please. Bring a written list of medications and supplements. Or if you're not sure, bring the bottles. Let the nurse figure them out. Bring a list, a written list. You know, Joe walks in and says, well, doc, I'm taking a blue pill and a green pill and a white pill. Which one should I take? Take them all. But we don't know. You don't know. And if you're like me, I get in there and they nurse their cell me, what's, what's your list? And I go, blah, I forgot. So I'm as guilty as anybody else of not writing my prescriptions down. That way they can check them and then the doctor will know exactly what you're taking. And if you're going to two or three doctors, it's important to make sure you, you that I know what your family doctor is taking and what your cardiologist is giving you so that I don't give you something that interferes with him. And I get a nasty phone call from the cardiologist saying, doc, you tried to kill my patient. Make a list of questions. Don't try to use your memory. Because if you're as like I am, I get in there and I'm as a patient, I forget. Write the questions down. You know, and try to give him maybe three. You can't, if they come, you come in there and have like 20 questions, uh, your ingrown toenails are probably not going to get answered. Repeat back the doctor's answers. <clears throat> when I say, Mrs. Jones, I want you to stay on your methotrexate at 20 milligrams a week. Write the answers down so you don't forget. Because it's been shown, it's been shown that when a patient walks out of my office and they're quizzed, they remember only 30% of what I've told them. So if you, and then if you're not sure, Bring somebody else along with you. If you're there with your mother, you know, write them down because your mother may not remember them either. And she'll say, now, what did he say? Listen and accept lifestyle changes. Joe, you're starting to develop diabetes. You're 40 pounds overweight. You can either continue as you are and we'll have to put you on medication or you need to get onto a diet and lose this weight over the next year. Listen to them. It may save you from that prescription. It may save you, may even take away one of your prescriptions. You have hypertension and you're a big salt eater. So you love, you love smoked salt fish. Well, if you cut out the salt, you may not have to take some of the medicines you're taking for your high blood pressure. Simple as that. But lifestyle changes are as important as a prescription. So many people just, oh yeah, doc, I, I know, I know, I know I need to lose weight. It, I'm not going to tell you that if it isn't going to make a difference. <clears throat> I don't care. I mean, it doesn't bother me, but it bothers you and it bothers how I can take care of you. Determine what other avenues are available. Can I go to physical therapy? Would that help me with this pain in my low back? Sure. Maybe I should see the dietician to help me figure out a better diet to cut down my lipids, my cholesterol, so I don't have to take that cholesterol medicine. Maybe I'm, you're showing some depression or you're having some anxieties, and this anxiety is requiring medication. Seeing a mental health practitioner may help you get out of that without taking medicine. Alternative therapies. Now, this is probably going to be brought up maybe by you, not by the physician. But, you know, if you, uh, you, if you all go on the Internet, you're going to find out. Or if you listen to uh, the, the, the TV, there's all of these magic, magic new 
potions that you can buy over the counter that will take your arthritis pain away. Ask the doctor. You know, I'm not opposed to sometimes saying, and I've told patients, acupuncture is a very appropriate way for some of your pains. Let's try it. Let's try a, a TENS unit. Let's try some of these other things. Now, if I'm, I'm not really sure that I'm going to tell you to take uh, blue emu oil, I'm sorry for the poor emu who got killed to get that oil. But look at the other avenues. Ask him. A follow-up appointment. What should I do, Doc? And when do you want to see me back to see how this has worked? He says, well, I want to see you in two weeks to see whether your, you know, your blood pressure is coming down. I won't start you on a new prescription until we see you back. Make sure you get that follow-up appointment and keep it. He, or he says, fine, doc. And he says, okay, I'll see you back in three months. We'll have your blood test done at that time. Find out why and be sure to get them done. I've had patients who call me and I get a call from the pharmacy saying, Mrs. Jones wants her prescription for methotrexate refilled. Well, she's had it for three months. She's just trying to save an appointment to you, but you know you need to see her to check for side effects and to make sure it's working. What if it's not working and she keeps taking the medicine? She's going to get worse and she's wasting her money and her time. And it's her health. So it's important to follow up. Fill your new prescriptions promptly. How many times do you go home, put it on the counter, and you forget about it? So you get a call from the nurse two weeks later and you say, oh, I haven't got it filled yet. Or, or please, if you're hurting for finances and you say, I can't afford that one, tell me. Because sometimes I can get you samples. Sometimes I can say, okay, that's fine. Let's get another medicine. My wife was given a prescription for one of her problems, and it was my share, our share of this prescription was $435. It was over $2,000. I said, I don't have that much money in my pocket right now. So we had to go talk to the doctor, and they gave her something that cost $75. So you can see, if you're having trouble, don't be afraid to say, I can't afford it. Or, Doc, I lost the prescription. Call the office. Let them know. Talk. We listen, or we're supposed to. Doesn't mean we always do. That's the problem. Now, those are, those are the ideas that Doc and I have talked about that will help you with your appointment. Russ is going to talk about his experiences, and I'm going to talk about mine, and then we're going to open this to all of your questions. And we can't be your personal doctor today. As I told Russ, I had an attorney walk up to me at a, at a party one night and ask me something very personal. He kept pushing me. So I finally said, sir, go over in the corner there and take off all your clothes and I'll be there in a half an hour. Well, that, he stopped. But that's what happens. So today, please understand, we can't be specific about you. Not unless you want to take off all your clothes and stand in the corner. And I'm not sure you want to. Neither do I want you to do that. So Russ, it's all yours, sir. Sound on? Okay, we're coming across. There's one main reason I'm able to do what I'm doing today in this coat. A simple act of randomness in 1971. Some of you may remember the draft lottery. And we knew on that day in August of 71 that a number over 196 would keep me out of Vietnam. I had lucky number seven. It was a sure thing. I shopped around to recruiters to see what options I had. Well, the Navy recruiters sold me on this six-year program in nuclear propulsion engineering. It was already a specialty in the Navy, nuclear power. But he said, you start with two years of intense trade school that are highly marketable when you're done. Most of the nuclear plants in this country are run by ex-Navy people like me. Some of you are probably old enough and young enough to remember the name Hyman G. Rickover. The admiral whose imprint is still on our nuclear navy. 
he insisted that we had to learn something about everything at every possible age of the equipment in an engine. The older the equipment, the more likely it is to spring a radioactive leak. My job was as a first responder to leak like that. But 90% of, 99% of my time was doing everything I could to prevent that leak. That meant mastering body chemistry in nuclear propulsion systems on warships. Very demanding methods. That was Rick Over's mind right there. Because he knew the difference between our nuclear sailors and the Russians in the 1950s. In Rick Over's Navy, I was teaching his future engineering officers my job. In the Russians, the enlisted people were expendable. You lose one, get another. 49 years ago, I was certified as a teacher in a secret place in Idaho, teaching anti-corrosion chemistry and radiation safety. But that made me a teacher. And learning that complexity in a high-risk environment that operates 24-7 is a perfect preparation for a career in medicine. When I started Hope College in 1979, I'd served for six years in the Navy. But I was attending school with a GI Bill. I knew that Hope was an excellent school. I'm the sixth of six boys graduating from Hope, third generation. Okay, And I knew that it's in the ideas of some medical schools, Hope College was a pipeline in medical school. And for me, it was. After three years, I added to three medical schools. And I decided to apply that same dictum of learn something about everything at every possible age to be the attraction to family medicine. From delivering babies to taking care of the 104-year-old grandmother of an OB-GYN doctor I scrubbed C-sections with. And everything in between. But I also noticed the difference between the Navy and patient medicine. Nuclear reactors don't have attitudes. <laughs> <laughs> but they all have good lawyers. Um, but going into family medicine really expanded what I needed to know, including serving the town where I grew up. So I had some of my grade school teachers as patients. I had four, two, gener two families of four consecutive generations of the same family under my care. Because you learn a lot about the chemistry between generations. And just as I learned body chemistry in the Navy, that was easy to adapt to the complex body chemistry of the human body. We had to learn complicated systems of machines in a high-risk environment, 2,000 pounds of pressure, 600 degrees. You can't have anything go wrong ever. But that complex complexity doesn't come close to the complexity of the human body. Patients have attitudes. And sometimes we have bad habits. <laughs> And, and as a family doc, I learned to take that in stride. In my first week in medical school, they taught me something that's still important. Patients are my best teachers. If I allow them to teach me. And that come, came from a simple skill of sitting down with paper and pen, not a computer, keeping eye contact. When I started medical school, they had just completed research on how long will a doctor listen to a patient's story before interrupting with a question? 17 seconds. How long does it take the doctor to listen to the whole story that eliminates 90% of the questions? 30 seconds. So I thought, I'll just sit down, be quiet, keep eye contact. But I taught myself with a clipboard how to keep eye contact like I am with you right now and write notes. And later I would translate into decision. And that precision of thinking in the Navy works well for human medicine as well. When I started medical school, the, the, the current state of what's called evidence-based medicine did not exist. That was coined in 1990. And my medical training was done in 89. But we had a class called critical appraisal, which was a forerunner of that. where They taught us to read research rigorously to know what's strong and what's weak, and what to do with that. They taught us how to organize our thoughts on paper for hospitals and nurses, called the SOAP or SOAP note. Subjective, what the patient tells me. Objective, what I see, what I measure, what I feel. 
assessment, the big picture plan. Where do we go from here? It's a simple way of organizing things in a high pressure environment, whether you're an intern. I remember delivering a baby in my 35th hour awake of a 36 hour day in obstetrics. That night I learned that a long hot shower at 5 a.m. was roughly the equivalent of an hour of sleep. I don't think they do that anymore. But it was also helpful uh, for 13 years. I staffed the, the whole clinic here, meeting all kinds of students from all kinds of places, all in handwritten notes. And it, 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 it extended the depth because a lot of the students were, were children of my patients. There's that family connection. And some of you may have heard of the name D. Ivan Dykstra. Okay. My, my father's younger brother. And the, the the variety of what a family doctor has to know means I never had a dull day. The difficult came difficult days came with computers. <laughs> because those of us who grew up without computers can't stand a chance to the, the young people of today. But we got our first computer system and it was clumsy. It was making mistakes all the time. In 2012, the hospital took us over. And they said, we know you have your system, but you must use ours, which was worse. And we looked for ways to save time, like voice recognition software. I thought, well, that's a save time. Now, here's an esoteric medical term. After a stroke, a patient can lose the ability to do this. Simple motion, complex name, dysdiadocokinesis. If I pronounce it like that, Computer would spell it right every time. My last name is Dykstra. Half the time would spell my name wrong. It's that IJ Dutch thing. Um, I, I want to leave us time for, for questions. We've got plenty of time to cover. Uh, but a, a huge event occurred for me 10 years ago when I had to, to uh, retire. I had been working in Holland Hospital's outpost in Zealand. And I was one of the first doctors that worked there. And I had been commuting to school or to work 12 months a year since 1980. Now in late April, when you're used to riding in winter weather in Michigan, late April looks pretty nice. I was just out having a fun ride on call for my practice for 10,000 patients. And on the path on 16th Street, I passed somebody on the, the walk. I had to go on gravel and I lost control because of the gravel. And my helmet smashed into her back knock me down, push the helmet over here. Murphy's Law says I have to land here. Instantly, six skull fractures. Internal bleeding here, internal bleeding here. At that moment, a patient of mine was driving by. Saw it happen, didn't know it was me, but did exactly the right thing. Screeched to a stop, call 911, just hold that head until the ambulance gets there. That's when he figured out he was holding his doctor's head. He'd been a patient with me for 20 years. His wife, the first nurse I hired. See, we know the word providence. A lot of us spell it with a capital P. That moment for me is all capitals. Because later, Dr. Lowry, you may know David Lowry, who rebuilt my skull. He says, that man's care was the only reason I survived that crash. There you go. And what I learned was what I could have lost in that crash and didn't because of the things that were going on at the time, like being physically fit, of getting exactly the right help at exactly the right time. Could not have been better. The ability to learn. When I, after the crash, I spent seven days of intensive care in Holland Hospital, remembered zero. Then three days in a step-down unit. The only thing I remembered was leaving Holland Hospital, telling me I'd be to be in mere free bed for three to five weeks, which is common. Well, they parked me in a room with somebody else, a young man who'd had a stroke of some kind, and he couldn't speak, couldn't swallow, but he made lots of utterances from both ends of his body. <laughs> and at three in the morning, I kept thinking, this guy needs a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm not his doctor. You can't sleep through that. So they caught me at three in the morning in the lounge watching reruns of Gilligan's Island. I didn't know like they knew. I needed to be sleeping 14 hours a day. 
And they sent me home to sleep 14 hours a day. My partners, of course, that was a bad day for them because all of a sudden each of them inherited, inherited a thousand patients who wanted them to be me. It doesn't work that way. But they supported me in my efforts to get back to work. We laid out a plan where the following year I had to pass a national board examination. And I went to an intense tra uh, training school in Philadelphia to prepare me for that. I had two weeks after that to study everything again and then take that exam and pass. During that two weeks, two weeks I was hidden with, with two losses, the people making money off my crash. That was a distraction enough that I failed that examination. I did not know then what I know now. That was the best thing that could have happened to me. If you're a doctor who's had a head injury, he goes back to work, he knows what I'm talking about. You got a target on your back in the shape of a dollar sign. Make that two dollar signs. Best thing that could happen. But I love teaching so much, I continue to teach things like this. Um, some of you may know Chris Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser. Uh, he and Peter Gauthier, he's a physicist at Hope, had started this educational group in the mid 80s looking at the interface between science and religion. And they invited me to join that group in 2016. And now that group meets in the living room of my home while my son makes pizzas for us. <laughs> but it's that experience, that convivial experience of being with people like this. You can't do that on a TV screen. We've all learned, some of us have learned Zoom. It's got its limitations, but it makes possible that this group that I meet with now, some of you have heard the, the scientist Stephen Hawking, okay? One of the members of my group yesterday who was there was his official biographer. Because they all look at the, the interface between religion and science. And what I talked about yesterday, I, I was a presenter yesterday, looking at evidence-based medicine, which, like I said, was recognized here in 1990, been around for 30 years comparing that to traditional Chinese medicine that's been around at least 3,000 years. And what is it about Chinese medicine that initially could not even be studied? 3,000 years ago, the Chinese did not believe in a nervous system. And yet they knew that acupuncture did good things. That's evidence. But there's some things you can't study. Sometimes the act of studying things changes what you're studying. Anybody who's taken physics knows about that. And boy, did whole college pound all that into me, but blended with liberal arts. That was maybe a good candidate for family medicine, learning how everybody learns and how people sometimes believe different things. Because as a doctor, I had to take all comers. And I was in training in the early 80s when the city of Holland went through a major social shift and a lot of churches brought Southeast Asian families here. You remember that? That changed the culture of this town just as mixing white people and Latinos. Separate conditions of the neighborhood I grew up in. But blending those backgrounds, I had learned all the complexities about belief systems in North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma. Not, not the same. But if they were here, they wanted me to understand them. That allowed them to be my best teachers. And so I'm, I'm grateful to be here and we'll keep doing this, but doing things like this is what keeps me sharp 10 years after this crash. And I'm at a stage now where things still get better with time. There are some things that'll never get better. But in three months after my crash, they measured something called the executive function, which is a problem solving part of the brain. You know what I'm talking about? In the left prefrontal cortex where my bleeding was. Three months after the crash, 16% of normal. Three months after that, 89% of normal. And that came from the roots of what I did between ages 20 and 26. Anybody familiar with that time frame and brain development? That's when the most sophisticated parts are finally built, plugged in, and they run everything. Those six years were my six years in the nuclear Navy in a high-risk environment that operates 24-7, just like a hospital. So I wound up having to learn something about everything, not once, but twice. Nuclear reactors who didn't have attitudes, but had good lawyers, and humans. 
and a lot of hope faculty. One last anecdote here. I got accepted into three, three medical schools after three years at Hope, but I could not graduate because I had not completed my religion requirement. Anybody hear the name Elton Bruins? Okay. He connected with me that I would commute back from medical school to meet with him to study John Calvin Institutes of the Christian Religion to finish my religion requirement. So that in 83, when I graduated, I already had a year of medical school under my belt. But all that came from that lucky number seven in 1971, but also coming from a blessed family who generations before me were trained at Hope College. Not as doctors, but Hope's good at everything. Now, we can decide where we go from here. Questions, answers? How does the role of insurance pay in your diagnosis? Probably doesn't, but more importantly, the treatment of your patient. It has a lot to do with it. And to some degree, decisions made by Medicare determine what the insurance companies do. And the insurance companies always want to save money and yet be popular with their clients. So I have to please the patient, the insurance company, and anybody's lawyers that happen to be up. Thanks. Russ, thank you. It's pretty hard to follow that act. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some issues, a bit different, that I see as important for you to know about when you're dealing with a family doctor and a specialist. How many of you here see more than one doctor? Okay, okay. How well do your doctors communicate? You say yes. <laughs> but I can tell you what happens today, was particularly with the computer systems, is that Hope's computer doesn't talk to this computer, doesn't talk to that. And unless you try to make an effort, you don't communicate. That's my first thought. Make sure that all of your doctors communicate with each other. Tell the nurse if you have to. Don't tell the doctor. Tell the nurse, please make sure the doctor's notes get sent to Dr. So-and-so. Mm -hmm. Very important. What happens when I see you and you're there for lupus and you have high blood pressure? Well, lupus can affect uh, blood pressure, can affect the kidneys. I need to know what your, your family doctor is treating you for high blood pressure because it's possible that that drug will make your kidneys worse. But if I don't know, and I rely upon your memory, you'll say, well, uh, it gives me a blue pill. That's, to me, one of the most important things. I had a, a patient who was seeing an a internist PA. This patient had lupus. And the PA took the patient off their lupus medicines. Because he said he didn't know anything about lupus. But he didn't read my notes either. Guess what? The State Board of, of Medical Examiners disenfranchised. Because he was trying to kill that patient. And when I talked to him, he admitted he didn't know a damn thing about rheumatology. <laughs> I don't think he had to be you know, knowledgeable, but just don't change medicines without telling each other. That's number one. Make sure that all of your doctors are communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. Very important. Very, very important. Especially in today's world where we all, each of these doctors may have different systems. 
computer systems. And that's the problem. You may have one, I may have one in my office, but when I come to the hospital to see you in the hospital, I have to write in a different computer system. Mm -hmm. Well, that's hard. I can't remember all the passwords and all that stuff. So I'm calling HI, I mean, or IT very often. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about, that's important because today's world is very complicated. Now, I want to address one issue that you may all have heard about, AI. Mm -hmm. AI. Now, I want to tell you one area, two areas in medicine where AI may be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Radiology. You go in and have a chest x-ray. And your radiologist reads that. Well, that radiologist may be more interested in some other diseases. That's been his training. So he doesn't think of all this, all the various par uh, parameters that may affect you or various diseases that could have. They're rare, but they could. AI will fill him in. So that report comes back to your doctor, and that has his impression plus AI in it. So the 10 other diagnoses that he didn't think about are mentioned. So it really can help in medicine today. AI has been helpful. Same thing with pathology. I had a growth taken off. It's come back. But anyway, the pathologist read it. But the pathologist, you know, has only a limited amount of knowledge. I mean, just like I do. He only knows certain things. But AI can fill in his report such that six other diagnoses may be suggested. So AI in medicine today in two areas, radiology and pathology, have great, great potential for better health care. That's important. What about ER? Pardon me? ER. ER? Uh that's a, that's another whole basket, and it depends on who's working in the ER. You may have family doctors working in the ER, or you may have ER trained subspecialists. Well, you come in with a collapsed lung, and the doctor who has been only out of his internship a year has only seen maybe 10 cases, where the, e the ER trained doctor has seen 50. So there's an importance there, it depends on where you go. It also depends on the ER, how busy they are. I'll tell you here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag about Holland Hospital. I had a stroke in 2019. I was down in South Haven. I got in my car to come home, and my hand wouldn't even turn. I couldn't get my whole arm to move the shifter in my car. I realized what was going on. My leg started feeling weak too. Well, everybody else had left. I was sitting in the parking lot, no one there. So what did I do? I put that arm up here and I drove back to Holland. Boy, did I catch help. But anyway, I walked into that emergency room here and I said, I'm having a stroke. Boom, within 10 minutes, I had an IV in place. I had seen a doctor. I was in the CAT scan. There was a protocol that they followed. They're, they're, they're monitoring this all over the country, these protocols. Mm -hmm. I've got to say that within 10 minutes, I was in the CAT scan. This hospital here immediately from the ER had a protocol. You say stroke, they everything else stopped, and they started doing this. Yes, sir. Along those lines, people, people may have heard of a treatment called a clot buster given for a heart attack in progress in the late 80s. Ten years later, that came available for using for strokes. Yes, like yes. This. Mine and, was not mine. And, and the first time that had ever been used in Holland Hospital was on a patient of mine. He'd come in. He had to come in within an hour of the onset. He was there within 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. We debated back and forth. We've never used this. Should it be any good? But we know he would fail if we didn't. 
We went for it and bam, it was gone. Just like that. The third thing I want to talk about within the field of rheumatology, let's take rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a disease for which we don't know the absolute cause. We have good ideas that it's environmental and it's genetic. But for most of my career, the medicines we were using to treat it really weren't doing putting the, 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 the disease to sleep. Today, we have medicines that if we start them right away, they can put that disease to sleep. But guess what? There's two things. One, you've got to take the medicine. Number two, you've got to be able to afford it. And that's the problem we have today with, with our, our pharmacy systems. These drugs are far, far, far outdated. I mean, uh, uh, overpriced. Um, I When I started seeing drugs like Humira and Enbrel, they were $12,000 a year. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I don't think I could afford, on my budget, $12,000 extra. So what we had to do is find ways of getting the drug cheaper. And that's part of that's part of the system we have today, that we don't have ways of making it cheaper. Now, President Biden signed the Medicare Environment, I mean, Medicare Act that allows Medicare to negotiate. You see, up until now, Medicare couldn't negotiate with the price. Pfizer used to tell them, Medicare, this is the price of this drug, take it or leave it. Medicare couldn't even suggest anything. Today, we're going to start to see some changes. We're going to be able, Medicare is going to be able to negotiate. We also are going to see some, some biologic similar, not generic, but biologic similar drugs. Drugs that may be just slightly different chemically. This huge long line of chemical structure but work the exact same way as the trade name. They're being done much more in Europe than in the United States. You know why? The pharmaceutical firms have pressed the biologic similars at the same price as the big ones. So we're not getting the benefit. So it's important for you to know that and to negotiate with your insurance company. And that's what many of us had to do. We had to put a whole person in our office that negotiated with insurance companies. First of all, let them see me. I got a, I got a question to ask you about the drugs. Yes, sir. Uh, I used to do drugs. Yes. <laughs> I remember, I remember making uh, Lipitor when we first started in 1997 and 96. Yes. The cost to make one kilo of Lipitor active costs us the price about a Mercedes. It's about ninety five thousand dollars. Yeah. And in two years, we brought the price down to about uh, two thousand dollars a kilo. Yes. A kilo. a kilo. So that was like a forty four decrease price. Yes. And it kept it kept going down. So during the patent protection period, Pfizer was making a lot of money. At the expense of Ronald Lambert and Park Davis, when I worked, yep, yep, they just fight us all and kept the profit. This is a good example of our pharmaceutical industry. I'm not opposed to it. They've done. You remember, if you look in Canada, they have not introduced a new drug in over ten years. Look what we have introduced here in the United States in ten years. I wouldn't want to start. Uh, I would say it's about a thousand drugs in 10 years. A, a thousand drugs. Thank you, Wally. So you see, the United States isn't all bad. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to paint it black. I want to paint, paint picture as it is. Now, what I have done is covered the things that I thought were, I think were important. You know, make sure there's good communication. Make sure you take the medicines. Make sure that you be aware of the costs and how to negotiate. I'm going to shut up. As you can see, I love to teach. I taught at Indiana University. It was very interesting 
I moved from Evansville, Indiana to South Bend, Indiana. And who should come walking in to practice rheumatology? But one of my students from the first year, he said, oh, my God, my professor is here. And I said, I'm going to keep my eye on you, young man. Right here. I can't remember. Harry Staley was a rheumatologist in, in Holland for a few years until he retired. When I was on the faculty at Indiana University, he was a fellow. So you see, I've been known Martin, Dr. Martin up in Grand Rapids and his group. I've known many of them from their training. They're all younger than I am. I'm an old, old fart. Okay. I, I do have another question to ask. Yes, sir. You. Why do the medical profession prescribe drugs that are actually precursors to cancer causing agents? Why do we do that? Because we also know that they may have other benefits that you have to balance one against the other. And that's the truth. We do, this is a, this is a stop gap. When we do some of these drugs, they can do cancer, but in some cases, in some cases, they also, maybe in the dosage we use, can have other benefits on the immune system. Along those lines, some drugs find their use evolves with time. Yes. A common combination in, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis is Plaquenil and Methotrexate. Plaquenil was originally developed to, to fight malaria. Methotrexate is derived from mustard gas during World War I. But they worked together in a powerful way. You know more about that than I do. Methotrexate was developed to fight certain kinds of cancers. Yes. It still is in much higher doses. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a compound like uh, ciprosporin. Mm -hmm. If you look at the chemical structure, it's made of uh, nine or 10 amino acids. All of these are secondary amino acids, yeah. unnatural. And secondary amino acids are cancer causing. Another good example is a mistinone, which is a drug for myostemia gravis, mm -hmm. and also used for treating the, uh, for preventing uh, nerve gas damage from the first Gulf War. Mm. Many of the GIs took that mm. and they mm. come down with this. Some of these drugs I can't syndrome. talk about because I don't know anything about. Yeah, anyway, that one is actually made from dimethylamine, which is another precursor for, to uh, for MDMA. Yeah. Remember, remember, Russ looked at the whole person. I looked at a very narrow area, but I had to look at everything that contributed to that. Everything that Russ did and that Dr. Jones did and that Dr. Smith did could contribute to this and could help me. If I said, hey, Dr. Jones is controlling your blood pressure beautifully, that saves us from having to worry about the effect of it on your arthritis or your kidneys. Thank you. Keep taking his medicines. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have a question online or it says, please comment on patient summary reports. It seems as though the summaries have gotten very abbreviated. Patient portals are relied upon mostly by physicians' offices. How can summary reports and or portals be used more efficiently? That's a good question. That relates to our computer systems, our computer systems. And it also relates to the amount of time that they're asking physicians to spend putting stuff into the computer. You know, I can remember many nights finishing my, my patients at five o'clock and because of the computers not leaving the office till 7.30 or eight o'clock, because I had to get all stuff, that stuff into the computer. And so it depends. And part of that is the physician. Part of that, you know, it's like I had, I had a, a good surgeon one time who uh, did an appendectomy. And he said, the patient came with belly pain. I examined him. I operated on him. I took out his appendix. End of report. <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he put down in his medical record. It's true. But he didn't say anything about how he did that. He didn't say anything about the appendix was retroperitoneal and took a lot of work. Okay, we're done talking. We're here to listen. Yes, go ahead. Can you turn that on? Okay. 
Ah. There we are. <laughs> okay. Um, I watch, you know, television and I see all these ads for these wonderful drugs and the side effects are going to kill you. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm not taking any of them. I mean, give me something natural, whatever. And so, I mean, am I being what, silly? What do you mean by natural? Uh, that's it. You know, herbs, uh, diet, uh, it would be exercise, all of that. And if God takes me, well, then so be it. But I, am I being unreasonable? In some ways, possibly. In some ways, you're using that term natural, uh, which to me is a, a cop out. Some of those drugs are very beneficial, but they all have potential side effects. Even your your herbs. Do you know that that uh, cinnamon can treat rheumatoid arthritis? But you got to take about ten pounds of it every day. <laughs> See, so there's a natural that you can hear about. Oh, it treats cancer. It treats this. Yeah, but how much? So you have to be very careful with that term, natural. The, the other thing with natural, you don't know how it got there. You don't know how it was processed. And a lot of naturals, they wind up with lead, plutonium, or you know, complicated chemicals from the harvesting process. You just don't know. Yeah. Right. Well, it's the FDA regulation. Now, that that's a good question. The FDA treats drugs supplements no and if you read that down there it says this meta this drug does not treat or diagnose or treat any disease wait for the microphone please yes wait for the microphone please oh go ahead yeah i was just thinking is it reasonable to refuse medication due to the side effects Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It depends on what the side effects are and what you see as the benefit from that medication. And I think that's a reasonable thing. You know, if if you're going to be placed on a, a drug that has use for cancer and <clears throat> it's being used for something else, you may want to be think twice, depending upon you have to ask. You have to ask. You have to know and I think the doctor has to give you legitimate material to read. Going to the internet is like going to the desert and looking for a grain of sand. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to get. Oh, just a second. I got one. I got one anecdote to tell you. We heard this from Dr. Gontier last couple of days ago, talking about grains of sand. S some physicist who had nothing more to do, figured out that there were 10 to 19th power grains of sand on all the beaches in the United States. 10 to the 19th. World. In the world. In the world. Not the United States. In the world. There are 10 to 23 power stars in the universe that we've identified. More stars than there are grains of sand. I just, I just had to say that. <laughs> It had nothing to do with the talk. It had nothing to do with the talk. But it just, this, it just blew my mind. Yes, sir. This question, I'm just looking for a very brief 50,000 foot answer, and I have a humorous part at the end. Uh, relative to Raynaud's, the etiology, the course, any treatment. And is that the reason why, with that disease and a lot of other ones, Michigander snowbird? What disease? Raynaud's. Raynaud's, that's one reason. Raynaud's can be treated, though. Yeah. We can treat Raynaud's. Raynaud's phenomenon is when your hands turn blue and mottled in the cold weather. One, stop smoking. Number two, stay away from, from smoking secondary smoke. Number three, there are some very, very effective drugs to help Raynaud's, but it doesn't work for everybody because of side effects. So, but do they go to Florida for that? That's one reason. That's a good reason too. Except if you want to go get early bird specials down there in Florida. It isn't one of the treatments for Raynaud's a blood pressure medicine? Certain blood pressure medicines work. Certain blood pressure medicines, reserping can cause Raynaud's. So we have to be aware. Yes, ma'am. What is a good non-intimidating way 
for your patient's lawyer to be able to reach you and your office and communicate? A non-intimidating way? That's a question. That's a good question. I'm not sure. What is he calling for? No malpractice claims. Just, a, a lot of times I run into clients who will have uh, capacity concerns and they'll be concerned uh, whether they were able to sign contracts or be sold the annuity. Uh, and well, doctors are on the forefront to see this that. Is, that's a very good question. I think the attorney can just send me a letter. Bingo. Or call me. Do it. You know, do if it he tells life. the nurse, I'm calling to talk to Dr. Jones about a mutual client. It's not a malpractice. That's immediately going to open up the door. And I'm going to listen to you. But you want it in writing. I learned early in medicine, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. Yeah. But no, that's that. those are very, very appropriate questions that imply that relate to the rest of the health mental health and the physical health of that person i thank you thank you i don't know whether this was a regional thing or a national thing i had my first um pregnancy in 1962 and I would go and visit my doctor and he would take an examination and ask me questions and everything was okay weight and blood pressure and all of that do you have any other uh things that you'd like to talk about well I'm tired all the time I just really don't have a lot of energy I can help you with that and they prescribed amphetamines and I don't know if that was a Detroit thing or not now, after all these years, I know where those amphetamines went, and it is recognizable in the behavior of my three sons. Was that a national or just a local thing? National. National. I think amphetamines, I mean, we've seen many drugs that have come out that we look like they were spectacular. And then after a few more years of using them, we found all the side effects and we learned and in some cases it takes several years to learn what those side effects are yeah. drug companies aren't in that years business. yeah yes yes but see drug companies aren't in that business researchers are researchers are and you there there's a there's a thing you can do if you are a patient and you're concerned about a side effect you can go to the mm -hmm. fda uh website and find a report a report site you can fill that out and send it to them. Those are listened and looked at. Yes, yes, it's still a bit. What's that? Oh, no, no, I'm talking about the report. Yeah, if, if you're taking, uh, let, let me, I, I had a patient who uh, was taking a medicine. I can't remember what it was uh, now. But anyway, all of a sudden, the patient's liver went bad. And I said, whoa. So we did a liver biopsy. We were able to show it. I sent it to the drug company. It was the first reported side effect from that drug. And now that drug is not on the market. But if you, I saw a, one thing happen, one patient, and I wrote, wrote a report and it got taken off the market. So they do listen to you. Not, I mean, not as quickly as maybe you want, but that's it. But no, those kind of drugs, I mean, reserpine is a good drug. This drug was used for in the 40s and 50s for high blood pressure. I don't know a doctor who even prescribes it anymore. I don't even know how many pharmacies even have it on the shelf. Yes, sir. How important is it to know your family history and how is it possible to even go digging up information on parents and grandparents who have passed away for many years? Go ahead. I thought that might be for me. Uh, family history is huge. Depends on how you write it down and how you learn it is what you're told reliable. Now, for me, it was easy when I followed consecutive generations in the same family, but not every doctor does that. But family history carries clues that mm -hmm. you may not catch. My mother died of a disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. She had it for six months and she was dead. I have that disease. 
I've been, I've had it now for over 12 years. They tell me it's never going to kill me, but I sure think so sometimes. But I went to, I went to, did some gen work on and went to Vanderbilt. At that time, they said there was a gene marker. Well, since that time, that gene marker has been thrown out. But anyway, so the importance of the family history is very important. Now, my father died at 47 of a myocardial infarction. My grandmother had heart disease, you know, and so the history of heart disease is very strong. My, my wife's father died of colon cancer. On that side of the family, his sister died of breast cancer. Another one died of breast cancer. So you don't think there's a gene in there for some cancerogenic process? Yes. So that family history is important. Now, how do you find out? Sometimes it's going to be very hard. Sometimes, you know, the medical records don't tell you anything. Sometimes you can't get those medical records. I, I, I'm going to blend in with something you said, myocardial infarction. The first house call I ever witnessed was for my father in an upstate New York rural town. But they, that's all the doctor did was house calls. And it took them an hour and a half just to get there. I was angry about that, but when you're up in the hills, that's what it is. And that's a distracting thought. I'll give it back to you. Many, many of the very rare, rare diseases. Uh, let, let's take Huntington's Korea. You may have heard about this. Huntington's Korea. Mm -hmm. It's been traced back to one of the persons on the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know, but Huntington's Korea is something that you need to know about because you could look for that marker and you can be aware now today in your siblings, for example, or, or your, your children. If they have that marker, you're going to be particularly aware of doing certain tests and looking at certain things to see if they're starting to develop. The problem is there's no treatment. In my previous comments, I got distracted by thinking about my father. But that time with him taught me the power of house calls. In 1987, I was still in training, but I could practice independently. I learned the power of house calls done on a bicycle in downtown Grand Rapids. I would ride there slowly and learn the neighborhood first. Then I would knock on the door, see how long it takes for someone to answer, who answers. But the peak learning was as soon as I was inside the door, the door was closed, things I would smell, things that would not smell. You can't hide cigarettes. You can't even cover it with fresh baked bread, but you can try. <laughs> but uh, what I found is that house calls were power powerful in my understanding things about my patients that I could not learn in my office. I'm in their terrain. I'm wondering if anybody here has been recipient of a house call. Okay. You know about that. And one time I was talking about this and, and somebody said, oh, how, doctors never do house calls. We do house calls. We don't advertise that. The only house call that I ever made was for an elderly nun who had terrible disease called scleroderma. I went and took, saw her and took care of her for over two years. And, you know, every two, three months I'd drop in, I'd call and they were, they would get, make sure the sister was properly dressed for me, <laughs> you know, and so on. But that was the only time I did. No, I've never done it. I, I, I've heard about that. Yes, ma'am. How much collaboration is there between physician offices and county, state, national health departments in reporting health data? Terrible. Terrible. It depends upon the laws of the local area. It depends upon the health officer. And it depends upon the physician being aware of what the laws are. But right now, it's it's variable. If you went from Kent County to Ottawa County, you probably would found, find all kinds of things different. Plus, Ottawa County is trying to pay their health officer $4 million. In, in for, for 25 years, I served as a doctor's doctor, 
a dozen doctors chose me to be their doctor. The last 10 years as a patient, patient has, has taught me a lot. Um, but the, again, I'm distracted. We have no, but no, I think uh, the gathering of data is important. We've learned that over the last, say, 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Gathering data gives us a bigger picture. You know, I may be seeing 10 patients with a particular disease, but if I put together with somebody uh, from Kansas who data gathers, he can put that together with 10,000 other patients. And all of a sudden we can start to see patterns. We can see things changing and that's important. And that ability exploded starting in the mid eighties. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but back, back to a house call thought. One amazing house call I had was with an orthodontist who, when I was in college, he agreed to do my um, dental work that I needed. I couldn't afford it as a little kid. If I would take care of him for the rest of his life, he wouldn't charge me anything. And in 2000, I, I knew he had lung cancer. I had diagnosed it with him. I just had this instinct. I should go see him. He's with hospice. I just had this instinct. I should go there. And he couldn't respond to me. He had a heartbeat that I could only hear through a stethoscope. Now imagine the sound of somebody holding a ticking watch to your ear and slowly walking away. That's how he left. Got a question, streptomycin. Yes. And myosin medication. Do, do those medicines today still cause maybe like auditory nerve damage? Yes, yes, yes. Kidney damage too. And we know that streptomycin Yes, it does cause auditory hearing deafness. I'm a stat for that. So yeah, we you know you know that those are drugs that we used before. That was one of those treatments for uh, tuberculosis. Sure, we don't use them anymore because we learned that. Anamycin, another fantastic antibiotic, also caused hearing loss. Mm -hmm. But back then. Kefla and canamycin were the only two drugs for what we call gram negatives. Right. And it was either that or let the patient die. And there's an answer to you about, about the side effects. You may know that there are some side effects, but you the other option is the patient's going to die. You know the patient's going to die if you don't try it. If you save their life, you can get hearing aids for them 20 years from now. What about the elderly? Are they more susceptible to auditory nerve damage yes. with the myosins? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. There's a how is it decided and who decides when an off-label use is used? Uh, what? Off-label use? The physician and the patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm license to prescribe any medicine for any disease that I want to. I have to tell the patient that it's off-label. They can make that decision not to take it, mm -hmm. but it, I make that decision, and it's my responsibility. If I can go back to house calls and medicines, one reason I'm wearing this, three hours ago, I was making a house call on a patient. Not my patient, but somebody I'd gotten to know who had had a lung, part of his lung removed in a hospital two weeks ago. And he called me complaining about incision areas that were getting redder and redder and redder. I knew instantly there was an infection, but I also knew I had to see it and see what he had been prescribed. He was prescribed cephalexin, some of you may know Keflex, by a doctor who had never examined him. Mm -hmm. He had no advice about what to do. So I taught this man in civilian term, in in, in uh, layman's terms, the mechanisms how medicines get into the body, and if there's a particular place that you want it concentrated, application of heat. If you wait long enough after you take the medicine, so I had say you know, take this medicine, drink a lot of water, lie on your right side so it kind of goes into your system quickly, put the heat on an hour later, because it takes that long to hit its peak, but at that peak. That's when you want it concentrated. 
right there. And I'm going to go back to see him on Saturday. Those are those are those are techniques that are the art of medicine. I agree. Not the science of medicine. Remember, there's the art and there's the science. The new young guy may know the science. He may not know some of the art. You have to balance both. You know, sometimes the older doctor can teach you things like that that you will never hear in medical school. And sometimes, like myself, if I went back into practice today, over the last, say, six years since I've been out of practice, there are so many new rheumatoid drugs, I mm -hmm. could not practice. Mm -hmm. I would be a detriment to my patients. Knowledge is changing. And uh, <laughs> I still read my journals, but I skim over a lot of stuff now because I say I'm not really interested. I'll tell you the thing that's changing is, gen is the genetics, the genetics, the gene therapies. Do you know they just approved, just approved like two weeks ago, commercially, a gene modification for sickle cell disease. It's been around for about four years. We've known about it, but it's never been tested enough to be commercially. It's terribly expensive, but it can cure by modifying a particular one amino acid in one gene in one of those 23 chromosome pairs. One, one new product this year is a vaccine to prevent RS, R, R, um, um, RSV. Yeah. Right here, just right. got it two days yeah. ago. It, there was a, a young woman 30 years ago, I took care of her on her first day of life. At three months, I had to hospitalize her for RSV. And she got through that okay, but we had already learned that it was likely that in 15 years, she'd be asthmatic. At age 15, she was asthmatic, asthmatic with an insatiable scientific curiosity. I, In my 15 minutes, I had to teach her lung physiology and anatomy and pharmacology. Why do you feel like this? Why do you sound like this? And what's in that mist that I inhale? And what's the machinery inside that? That young woman, young woman is now in a MD-PhD program, University of California. But it came from me letting her be my teacher. So funny, I'm going to say this. So funny you should mention amphetamines. Just recently, there was a physician working in an ER, not here, not where he was here, who had been hired in. It was when he's kind of went here, went there, went there. And one of the professors of medicine went to talk to him and tell him he's making a mistake. You know what that guy did? He turned around and said, here, take some of these and offered him amphetamines to get him to shut up. The doctor was taking them and was offering to the other doctor to get him to shut up. But wait a minute. How can you shut up when you take amphetamines? <laughs> well, that, that, right. Russ, that's the unanswerable question. <laughs> We've got about about twelve minutes left. We got more questions. I was just going to make one a couple statements about what you said. Um, so I'm not a doctor. Uh, I've done computers all my life, fifty plus years. And two things you said, or that I would just share. Um, one, the whole point about AI. It's what's really behind what he was talking about is what's called machine learning. And so they can take and absorb. Uh, he talked about the radiologist example, uh, and a radiologist might have seen, you know, 100 cases or 200 cases, but under machine learning, they can absorb x-rays from thousands and thousands of people mm -hmm. uh, that have been di diagnosed. And so that's how the AI, it's not as it, people make it sound a little bit more mystic than it really is. It's just a matter of knowledge. It's just, it's just you're absorbing it's a, it's a massive amount of information. Piece. And from that, can come up with a more sophisticated diagnosis and, and same way in the other case. So that was one thing. Last, <clears throat> last thing is we talked about, <clears throat> and this is a caution, is the sharing of information in the computer systems. Again, I'm a computer guy and I spent many years, we had 90 pharmacies hmm. and trying to interface 
the information we knew about patients back to the doctors that were diagnosing and, um, and uh, prescribing the drugs so that they knew that they filled the prescription, that getting that communication, the communication between the computer systems all I'm saying is a caution. It's not good news. No, um, no. There's a lot of work going on, but everybody has a different um, uh, motivation and their willingness to share information. And there's, I could go on, I could do a half class just on this topic. Yes, but yes. You would all be bored, bored and to sleep. But I'm just telling you, share the, share what they're saying is really, really important. Share the information because there's a lot of good information in their various computer systems varying standards so you talked about the example of uh, i think was a uh, birth or whatever that they didn't they didn't provide much information every doctor's different in terms of what they what information they put in the computer systems and then getting them to share between hospitals mm -hmm. uh, practices uh, and so forth it's there's a lot of effort like i say i could teach a class on it but don't hold your breath and so um, i i just encourage you to share what they're um, saying about sharing information because the the computer systems are not talking. It's eventually going to happen, but it's going to take a yeah. very long time. You well, have to keep in mind your... that the insurance companies who are the ones who tell physicians, yes, you can't have that, you can have that drug, or no, you can't, don't always look for the person at their end who's knowledgeable. I wanted methotrexate back in the old days when you had to get down your hands and knees and beg for methotrexate. One of the insurance companies denied it. They said, try naproxen first. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. called them. The doctor that I had, who was their quote expert was a retired OBGYN. Okay. He didn't know diddly squat about rheumatoid arthritis, but he made the decision that that insurance company denied the drug to me, for me. So you have to be aware that you have to fight sometimes. You, you so talked, if they uh, deny you, change, challenge it. You talked about systems communicating with each other. Yeah, the system. So, some systems will put up barriers. Yes. In, 30 years ago, I learned I could never talk to anybody at the VA. No, the would VA, oh, yeah. But you see, that, that it's, John's one other thing. The computers can can make life miserable because one system doesn't talk to the other system. And so communication can be a problem. Sometimes I would say, make a copy of my note, put it in the mail and send it to the doctor. That way I didn't have to worry about the computer systems. Now, the next question was, did he read it? Yes, ma'am. We've got about five, six more minutes. I hope I've answered your questions. I hope I've, we've entertained you as well. You mentioned OBGYN. Is there still a controversy about postmenopausal women taking hormone replacement therapy? Yes. Yes. It, it may Tell replace us. hormones and help with the menopausal symptoms. But as far as the long-term taking of hormones, we know that it's, it's associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And we know that it does not prevent osteoporosis. Hormones do not by themselves do it. Activity helps. Activity helps other things. You were, I think you were here when we talked about, about osteoporosis so you heard me yes i i recognize you i know you're here i know many of you are here yes calcium carbonate is the cheapest but it's not the most well absorbed yes sir I was a practicing dentist when the initial uh, osteoporosis medications came out and it was touted in the medical side of the house as very beneficial for bone. But on the dental side of the house, people had intractable wounds that wouldn't heal on extractions and other oral surgery. That's not talked about much on the medical side. 
haven't heard that. It is still recognized. It still is the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the healing is still a problem. And you hear that with every one of these commercials. They recognize that it's still a problem. So I can't tell you it's not gone away. It just isn't talked about. Well, that's a possibility, but the probability is not very high that I know of. You have seen it from that end. So I need your in input right. to hear that too. So my opinion, maybe not what you've seen. So that the idea is let's get together and talk it over and see what we thought we know. Before, You'll teach me and I'll teach you. Be, before we close, I want to share a parallel antidote or anecdote, one from 1990, one from last week. In 1990, I had a patient who was a very gifted sculptor of full-scale clay models of cars at GM. But he had served in the war in Korea and saw terrible things who could never tell anybody anything. My medical school taught me how to detect depression. There's a wonderful new product called Prozac had just come out. And I said, we should try this. Come back and see me in six weeks. He looked me in the eye. Six weeks later, he says, Doc, you gave me my life back. Yeah. Through my brain injury support group, at very Freeman, I met a young man who at age 18 was ranked the number one tennis player in this country. He became a tennis pro. Had a COVID vaccine that went bad. Gave an intractable headache. Had to do spinal taps to find out what was going on. That permanently damaged him. Changed his vision. One of the, the assets of my continuing to read modern literature is I came across something about a particular type of glasses that might help his altered vision with prisons. You know what I'm talking about? And he he told me the same thing last week. Doc, you gave me my life back. But study and listening, that's teamwork. Bottom line, before we end, we physicians are not perfect. We physicians have our own blocks, our own biases, and we have, we are sometimes very unknowledgeable. So the idea that holding physicians to an impeccable standard is difficult but you people often do that to us. So we'll accept that and do it. But remember, we are not perfect. We do make mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes are based upon bad information and bad study. Sometimes those mistakes just occur. You know, uh, and so I have to tell you, you know, my legal friends, and I, I'm talking to you, uh, they know that. Sometimes we are responsible for our mistakes. And that's where malpractice comes in. Now, it doesn't mean that every whiffin has to be sued. God knows. In 35 years, I have never been sued. Partly because I tried to do the very best I could, but I also documented everything. That's the key. When the attorney called me or the patient's lawsuit came in, I called my attorney and I said, well, what about the letter, the return, the registered letter, return receipt telling him to stop that medicine? Oh, well, that'll probably stop the suit entirely. That was gone. They hadn't, the guy hadn't told his attorney that he had a letter saying, stop this medicine. And I had a copy in my notes. But see, so it's, it's we are not perfect. God knows. So I, I hope we've entertained you. And you we remember, hope we've entertained you. Um, we have one final one more question. One more question, and that may be a good segue for this one. How does one comfortably go about getting a second opinion? What you can do is tell the doctor, you know, I, I've had this happen, and I just did this myself. Doc, I like what you said, but I'd like to get a second opinion. 
And if a doctor has any ethics, he's going to say, fine. Mm -hmm. If he, he boohoo's and belittles you, get the hell out of that office. Get the hell out. No, and, and I tell, if I'm going to see somebody, I say, I'm in here for a second opinion. Just tell yeah. him upright. Right. But I told him, I, you know, if, well, let's see an example. My wife just got told she needs $26,000 worth of dental work. I looked around and I talked to another dentist and he looked at this and he said, yep, everything's fine. You're doing exactly the right thing. So I'm not questioning. But if I had a question or if somebody said something, I would get a more, my wife would get a more formal opinion. If you're not sure, ask for a second opinion. It's, it's like, you know, it's not a matter of my, a drug, but maybe it's a procedure. They say, take a cataracts off both eyes today. And bringing up a second opinion option is not an insult to the doctor. No. It teaches the doctor that you need to know everything you can. That's right. I mean, I learn sometimes when a patient comes back, uh, a pathology report read this. We went to Northwestern and the pathologist said, oh, that was not really accurate. This is right. Well, save my wife having to have her breast taken off. But in many cases, they'll say, we, we, went, we went to University of Michigan just recently for something else. And the doctor there said, hey, that pathologist in, in West Michigan did a very, very clean, clear report. We walked out of there saying, that makes me feel very happy about going to Holland Hospital. But it also means I know or she knows what she's what's going on. Thanks, folks. Yeah, thank you very much, both of you. We'll be here. We'll try. But uh if you get too personal, I'm going to have you take off all your clothes and get in the back corner. Thanks so much, Doctor. Thank you, sir, for Dr. doing it. Doctor Dijkstra, thank you so much. It's fun doing yeah. this. Oh yeah, it is. You guys did great. Well, we, one we, thing I forgot to mention, they the medical school they taught me always who to please first in the hospital. Nurses, nurses. Yeah. They do all the. Work. Yeah, they do a lot of work. Yeah, not all the work, but a lot of work. Yes, sir. You mentioned calcium yeah. pills. Thank you. Yes. And you said calcium uh, carbonate was always not expected for absorption. Calcium carbonate, if you take it molecularly, gives you more calcium per, per molecule yeah. calcium carbonate than anything else. But it's not as well absorbed as calcium so, pit. Could you spell citrate? C I T C I T R A T E. And that's what we should take. Calcium citrate actually is better absorbed. I mean, it gives you, it's better absorbed with calcium carbonate. Because I, I take something from past or I'm trying to remember what it's called. I'll look and see if it's citrate yeah. or not. Well, there are many times calcium carbonate is the cheap. Okay. And but you have because there's less calcium in a molecule of calcium citrate, you may have to take more tablets of the citrate to get, to get the same amount of calcium of absorption. Yes, of okay. absorption. Yeah. Thank you. you know, it really their calcium lactate is also harder to find. Calcium carbonate is cheap. It's chalk. Okay. But it if you really want the most most bang for your buck, yeah. Calcium citrate gives you more okay. bang. Is there a pill that, a brand that you I, 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 if you want me to stand in the corner and start? No, 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 no. Okay. You, 